Okay, so in this video I'm just going to go through the Year 11 IGCSE Physics Mock. I am going to give you all the correct answers here, but what's really important to remember throughout this video is that you need to make sure that you understand the science behind what's going on. So if any of the things I'm saying don't make sense to you, uh, then you really need to record it on your one-stop doc and make sure that you go over it later. So question one, speed is a scalar quantity and ve velocity is a vector quantity. State how a scalar quantity differs from a vector quantity. Nice easy start here that should just be very simple for revision. You always need to remember that any velocity, sorry, any vector has size and direction. While on the other hand, a scalar has size only. Now a better word to use than size, um, if you want to really impress the examiner, would be magnitude, which effectively means the same thing here. Part two, underline the two scalar quantities in the list below. We've got energy, force, impulse, momentum, and temperature. So we're looking for the ones that don't have a direction attached. Well, force, impulse, and momentum all do have directions. So the answer that we're looking for is energy and temperature. Part B, a boat is moving at a constant speed. On figure 1.1, sketch a distance time graph for a boat. Important to realize this is a distance time graph. So we're going to assume that we start at a distance of zero, and our distance is going to increase at a constant rate. So we're looking for a straight line with a positive gradient. If we're traveling at a constant speed, that's what we'll be looking for. Part C, the boat in part B is moving due west at a speed of 6.5 meters per second relative to the water. The water is moving due south at 3.5 meters per second. Um, now, maybe it's just me, but sometimes I always, I, I tend to forget uh, the order of the compass. So you might want to write a little compass uh, into your page somewhere, um, just, to, just to help you remember it. Um, so what we're dealing with in this question is one vector uh, which is moving at 6.5 meters per second west, and a second vector which is moving south at 3.5 meters per second. Um, now, they tell you very clearly to state the scale that's being used. Looking at this page um, and thinking, right, looking at the ruler that I've used here, I'm going to choose a scale of one centimeter is equal to 0.5 meters per second. That would mean that two centimeters gives me one meter per second. Uh, turning that into a scale over here, that would mean that my 6.5 meters per second becomes 13 centimeters on my scale, and my 3.5 meters per second will become 7 centimeters on my scale. So the first thing I need to do is draw a 13 centimeter long line uh, going across my page. So um, this is a little bit tricky to do on Explain Everything. Uh, because the ruler doesn't really work on the particular version I'm using, so you're going to have to imagine that green line I've just drawn is perfectly straight and not all wibbly and horrible like I've drawn it. Uh, but that's going to be my 6.5 meters per second. Uh, now I'm going to grab a protractor and I'm going to make sure that I'm marking a 90 degree angle over here. Let's try and get it about right. Again, I'm doing this very, very roughly on here, uh, just because explaining everything doesn't quite make it as easy as it should do. Um, you guys will, of course, do this much more carefully than I've been doing it. So now I need to take my ruler, turn it like that, and I need to now draw a seven centimeter long line, acting in the south direction. Uh, 
That will be seven, my 70 centimetre long, long line going through that point. And I'm going to record it as well as 3.5 metres per second. Now, to get my resultant vector, uh, we need to do the combination of both vectors. So it will look something like this. Once again, can't stress enough, you will be using a pencil and a ruler for all of these. You're asked to find the size of the resultant vector, so I'm going to measure this with my ruler. Measuring it with a ruler, I'm getting something that is about, here we go, Ooh, stay still you, about 15 centimetres give or take, so I'm going to say that this is about 15 centimetres, which with my scale would equate to 7.5 metres per second. And actually, 7.5 would have been an accepted answer on this mark scheme. Uh, if you wanted to know, you need to get a value between 7.2 and 7.6 metres per second. And then I'm asked for the direction of the resultant. So to get the direction, I'm going to bring back in my protractor, put it there, and I can see that if we're calling due north up here, zero degrees, then I will have done 90 degrees there plus about 150 degrees, so I will get direction is 90 plus 150, which is 240 degrees. Um, and actually, the mark scheme is looking for an answer of between uh, 20, uh, sorry, 239.5 and 244. So again, even with this uh, fairly ropey method that I've employed here, you could get all the marks. Two part A. Acceleration is a vector quantity. Underline the two vector quantities in the list below. Well, this is a bit of a recap of the previous question. If it's a vector, it must have a magnitude and a direction. So of the things here, force has a direction, and so does impulse. Question three, figure 2.1 shows a vehicle designed to be used on the moon. That's a golf, that's a, a moon buggy. The brakes on the vehicle are tested on Earth. The acceleration of free fall on the moon is one sixth, one over six, the value on Earth. Tick one box in each column and table to predict the value of the quantity when the vehicle is used on the moon compared to the test on Earth. So 10 times, sorry, the mass of the vehicle. Really important to remember here that mass is not the same as weight. Your mass is how much stuff there is. Uh, if you think about chemistry, it's uh, related to the number of particles. So the mass is not going to change. It will be the same on Earth. The weight, however, will be reduced. Weight is equal to mass times gravity. So if gravity is one sixth of what it is on Earth, then the weight will be one sixth of the value on Earth. Now, the deceleration of the vehicle on the moon with the same braking force. This is a little bit trickier, but not terribly difficult. Here we're going to think of the buggy, and it has mass m. If it's travelling along with a velocity, then if we want to make it break, we need to apply a force, which I'm going to call force b for, for, for braking force, in the opposite direction. Now, gravity or weight acts downwards, so it's at 90 degrees. So the fact that the weight of the vehicle has changed doesn't have any effect on the braking time. So the deceleration should 
will be the same as it is on Earth because weight acts in the up and down direction, but we're concerned with forces in the horizontal direction, um, and they shouldn't affect each other. Figure 2.2 shows the brake pedal on the vehicle, and if you look at this, the first thing you should be thinking straight away is, right, okay, I have here a pivot, so you should start to think, hmm, okay, maybe I need to use some moments uh, knowledge, and I've got a piston, so if I've got a piston, I should be thinking about hydraulics. The driver exerts a force on the pedal which increases the pressure in the oil to operate the brakes. The area of the piston in the cylinder is 6.5 times 10 to the negative 4 meters squared. And they've very kindly um, given us that in non-standard form as well. And then it says the pressure increase in the oil is 5.0 times 10 to the 5 pascals. Calculate the force exerted by the driver on the brake pedal. This is quite a complicated question. There's two different phases to it. What you have to do is, firstly, find the force at the piston. So we've got a force acting over here at the piston. But actually, that force on the piston is not the same as the force exerted by the driver. So to find the force at the piston, we are going to be using uh, pressure calculations. But then we're going to have to find the force on the pedal. And to find the force on the pedal, you're going to need to use some moments calculations. So this was quite hard. So let's start off, let's do question one, or part one. Uh, we need to find the force on the piston. So whenever we're dealing with something like this, we're going to use the equation pressure is equal to force divided by area. Um, and we need to find the force. So if I rearrange the equation, I'm going to get force is equal to pressure multiplied by area. Uh, the pressure they've given me is 5 times 10 to the 5 pascals. And I need to multiply that by the area of 6.5 times 10 to the negative 4 meters per second, meters, sorry, uh, meters squared, which gives me a force of 330 newtons. Going on to the second part, I now need to find the force here, so that I've got a moments question. So if we redraw this as a moments problem, I have a force acting that way, which needs to be 330, but I'm providing that with a force here of an unknown amount. So I have a distance of 7 centimeters here, and I have a distance of 24 centimeters there. So what I'm going to say is that the moments here will be the same. The moment here is equal to the moment here. So I can say that force, as so I'm going to start off by saying moment is force times distance. So the moment will be 330 times 7. Uh, which is 2310 newton meters. Um, I can then say that 2310 is equal to the unknown force times distance of 24. So my force is 2310 divided by 24, which comes out as uh, 96 newtons. And depending on how you rounded this, you may get some values slightly larger, some values slightly smaller. Don't forget that the unit is always Newtons. 
Question 4. Part A. The graph in figure 6.1 represents a wave on a rope. Um, what we can see here is on the y-axis they've put the vertical position in centimetres and along here they've put the distance along the rope. Um, quite important to recognise then that this distance here um, is not a time, it's a distance itself. So this graph is actually showing the real rope. Um, it's a little bit different because obviously the scale here is different to the scale here. But other than that, this is actually what the rope looks like, frozen in time. Um, and as time goes by, the rope is going to be going up and down. So this peak will move downwards like that. This peak will move upwards like that. Okay, so part one, use figure 6.1 to determine the amplitude of the wave. Uh, to do that, we need to look at the height of the wave. Now, what you need to remember is that amplitude is the distance from the zero point, from the central point to the top. So it's the distance I've just drawn on the graph. That means that the amplitude is going from 4.0 up to 7.2. So to calculate the amplitude, we're going to the amplitude will 7.4, which is the value at the top, take away 4.0, which is the value at the bottom, which comes in at 3.4 centimetres. Don't forget, whenever you give a, 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 a number, always give a unit. This is in centimetres, therefore my answer must be set in centimetres. It then says for the wavelength of a wave. Now, the wavelength of the wave will be the distance that I'm marking onto the screen now. So it's the total distance from one wave to the next. And reading off the scale here, uh, this comes to 30 centimetres. Uh, so that was quite an easy one. Remember, if it was a graph that looked like this, uh, where you had, say, your vertical position against time, then you would be using the equation uh, v is equal to f lambda, lambda is equal to f over v. But we're not going to be using any of those because uh, this is actually a distance on the x-axis. So it's really this is a real good lesson of why you should carefully uh, read your axes. Part B. A wave travelling on the surface of water has a wavelength of 2.5 centimetres and a speed of 8.0 centimetres per second. Calculate the frequency of this wave. So this is a bit of a gift. Uh, we're going to start off by using the general wave equation, which is that the velocity of a wave is equal to its frequency multiplied by its wavelength. Uh, we've been given the wavelength. That's 2.5, and we've been given its speed. So I can substitute this into my equation, and I get 8.0 is equal to uh, frequency multiplied by 2.5. Rearrange that equation, and I get F is equal to 8.0 divided by 2.5. So my frequency is 3.2 hertz. Again, very important to know that the unit of frequency is the hertz, capital H, lowercase z. Um, one little potential uh, trap here that they laid for you was the fact that this was in centimeters. So you had a, a distance in centimeters and a speed in centimetres per second. Now, because both of those were in centimetres, I didn't need to do any converting at all. If you wanted, though, um, you could have done a conversion and said that 2.5 centimetres is the same as 0 0.025 metres to and 8.0 centimetres per second, second is the same as 0 0.08 and likewise 8 centimetres um, and if you put those two equations second, 
throw those two numbers into your equation, you, you've got the same answer as well, um, but it just wasn't necessary to do, to do that in this case. Part C. The wave in B approaches a barrier that has a large gap in its centre. Figure 6.2 shows the crest of the wave view from above. Um, so a couple of things to point out. The wave is travelling this way. Um, each of these uh, her vertical lines is a wave that's going through a barrier. Now hopefully, the first thing that's going to into your head is all oh, waves going through a barrier. This is a diffraction problem. Um, and sure enough, it then says the gap in the barrier is larger than the wavelength lambda. On figure 6.2, draw the pattern formed by three crests after the wave passes through a gap in the barrier. So, a couple of things to note. First of all, if they say by three crests, they probably mean by three crests. Three crests. So, do be careful to do what they actually tell you. Uh, to do. So what we're looking for is, uh, first of all, whatever this distance here is, you want to have about the same distance between your waves because after diffraction wavelength doesn't change. So you can do it by eye, but we're expecting you to see, if I can see, three lines that are about the same wavelength as the previous wave. However, we're also going to get diffraction happening, so these waves will be curved at the edges. And the further they go from the uh, barrier, the greater they'll be curved. So something like that is good. You probably want it to be a little bit straighter in the middle here um, in this section than I've drawn it, but again I'm writing with a pen on the screen so it's a bit harder. Water is added to the tank and the speed of the wave in the deeper water is greater than the shallower water. The frequency of the wave remains constant, but its wavelength is different. So you are asked to state and explain how the wavelength in the water, in the deeper water, has changed. So the key thing to think about here is the fact that the frequency uh, is the same, but the speed has gone up. Now, if you think about what a wave actually is, um, you could think of it kind of like, um, if I have a string, the frequency is how many times a second you're moving it up and down. So for my water wave, the up and down motion hasn't changed. However, the speed that the wave's traveling at, the velocity, has gone up. Now, a wave is caused by the water moving up and then moving down. So if you think about it, if the velocity has gone up, then that means that the waves will now be more spread out. So we would expect the wavelength to increase. But sadly, just saying that wasn't enough, because the question, and it did say it fairly clearly, the question said to state and explain. Now when you get and explain, that means give a reason for your answer. And you'll see it's only worth one mark, so you had to do both of these to get the full mark. So what they were looking for was for you to say that the wavelength will increase because the wave travels further in the same time. Now that's an increasingly common question, so it's probably worth making sure that you know it. Part 2. Apart from the change in wavelength, describe one other difference in the pattern formed by the crests after the waves pass through the gap. So this is taking your general knowledge about diffraction. What you should know is that the greater the wavelength, the greater the diffraction. And that's always the case for any wave. Um, that's the reason why you can't see round corners. You can't see round corners because light has a wavelength of a few nanometers. It's very, very small. But you can hear somebody outside in the corridor because the wavelength of sound is much, much longer. So bigger wavelengths have more diffraction. So the answer to this one was you would see more diffraction.
or it would diffract by a greater amount. Question 5. The speed of light in air is 3.0 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. The speed of light in a transparent liquid is 2.0 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. A ray of light is instant on the surface of a liquid at an angle of instance of approximately 40 centimeters. Uh, so what, what that would look like is something like this. So we would have a tank of a liquid that would look something like this. And we've had a ray of light come in at an angle of about 40 degrees. Now it's important to remember that angle of incidence is always measured from the normal. So I've put the normal in here as a dotted line. Um, and first of all, you can start thinking, well, what would I expect to happen? Um, what I always do in this case is I imagine a car. So there we go, I've just put a car in. Um, I want you to think about is if a car is driving on a tarmac road and then it hits something where it's slower, how will it change? Well, for an ordinary car, it's got a wheel on this side and a wheel on this side. So what will happen is, as it enters the slower medium, the car is going to change direction. And it's going to bend this way. It's going to bend towards the normal. And the reason for that is, one side slows down, but the other side is going quick, more quickly. Um, so that will cause it to bend. So, And I genuinely do this. When I have to work out uh, something moving and diffracting, I actually get two fingers, and I make a little car, and I make my car drive along the incident ray, enter the medium, and then go, right, which way would a car move? A car would bend that, whoops, a car would bend that way, um, so I draw the car the way it would have actually moved. Um, and I find that's quite, that's quite a useful thing to do. Um, so straight away, um, you can see later on in the question I'm being asked to find the angle of refraction in the liquid. Well, it should be smaller than 40 degrees. I'm expecting something that will bend towards the normal. But we're not going to that yet. What we're being asked to do for now is to find the refractive index. So the equation that you need to find refractive index of anything is refractive index, which is always given the letter n, is equal to the speed of light uh, in uh, a vacuum or in the air divided by the speed of light c. And I'm going to use l here for the liquid. So the speed of light in air is 3.0 times 10 to the 8 divided by the speed of light in the liquid, which is 2.0 times 10 to the 8. And when you plug that into your calculator, you'll get a value of 1.5. There is no unit for refractive index. It's one of the very few things that has no unit. Part 2. Uh, calculate the angle of refraction, just like we were expecting. So to do this, we're going to use Snell's law. And Snell's law says that refractive index is equal to sine of the angle of incidence divided by sine of the angle of refraction. So substituting what I know, I'm going to get 1.5 is equal to sine of 40 divided by sine of r. Um, so to rearrange that, I'm then going to get sine of r is equal to 1.5 multiplied by sine of 40 and then to get r I'm going to take inverse sine of all of this so inverse sine of 1.5 times sine of 40. Um, make sure that your calculator is in degrees mode not radians and what you'll get is a value of 25 degrees again don't forget your units Okay, part B. Figure 7.1 shows a side view of an object at the bottom of a tank of liquid. Light travels slower in this liquid than in air. On figure 7.1, draw two rays from the object into the air. Use these rays to locate the image label this image I. Okay, so this 
is a little bit of a trickier question. So for this you're going to need to use two different skills. Uh, the first skill that you will need to do um, is to remember how refraction works. And second, you're going to have to remember how to draw image diagrams or to get images from ray diagrams. Um, so to find where the image is, what we're going to have to do is draw the path of two light rays and then find where they meet. And if we can do that, then we're going to get the correct line. So the first thing we're going to do is just draw any line of a light ray leaving my object. I'm going to draw it leaving there, and here's a normal. Now, if you think back to what we did earlier, we know that it will bend away from the normal. So it's going to follow that path. And then what I'm going to do is draw a second ray coming at a smaller angle. It's got its own normal, and that one also bends away from the normal, but it won't bend as much. So I've got something like that. Those are my two light rays. Now to find where the image is, images are always formed where virtual light rays would meet. So I'm going to extend these rays back into my liquid. So there's the first one, and there's the second one. Now obviously you need to be using a ruler. Now an image is always formed where your rays meet. And in this case you can see that they're meeting here. So this is my image I. The image is formed higher up, uh, le uh, less, less of a height of liquid than it appears. And this explains why you look into a pool, swimming pools always look shallower than they actually are. Um, it's because the image of the bottom of the pool is always higher up than the actual bottom. And that's caused by refraction. Uh, so one of the things you need to remember um, is that an image is formed from where your eye, eye thinks the light rays has come from. From your eye's perspective, these two rays are straight, so it believes that it's come from there, even though it's actually bent. Question 6. Figure 8.1 shows a 12-volt power supply connected in a circuit. The circuit includes a lamp and a resistance wire AB of constant cross-sectional area. Um, so it's worth pointing out right at the start, here is A, here is B. So this is the wire here. Um, there is a sliding contact that can be moved between A and B. Now it's worth starting off just thinking about what that means. What we've effectively got here is a variable resistor. So I could redraw this circuit to look like this. There would be my power supply, there would be my bulb, um, and I've basically got this variable resistor. Uh, they've just done it in a slightly different way. So the rating of the lamp at normal brightness is 6.0 volts, 9.0 watts. And you are first of all asked to calculate the current in the lamp at normal brightness. So the first equation that we're going to use is that power is equal to current times voltage, or P is equal to IV. Because this is at normal brightness, um, I can use these numbers. These numbers mean um, that's what the lamp is expecting. Therefore, I can say that the power is 9.0, and that it will be equal to whatever the current is times 6 volts. Um, so it's just worth remembering that Power is measured in watts, voltage is measured in volts. So those are the two values that I was given. Uh, rearrange this equation, I get that the current is equal to 9.0 divided by 6.0, uh, which comes out at 1.5 amps. Then calculate the resistance of the lamp at normal brightness. Okay, there are two different ways you can do this. One equation is to use uh, the fact that voltage is equal to current times resistance. And then you can use the fact that I have a current here uh, and I have a voltage here. The voltage is 6. So substituting in my values, I get a voltage of 6 volts. 
is equal to a current of 1.5 amps multiplied by whatever the resistance is. So I get the resistance is 6.0 divided by 1.5. Uh, which comes out as, uh, oops, sorry, <clears throat> which comes out as 4.0 ohms. Now, there is a second way that you can do this, and this way is actually a little bit safer. Um, using this method here, I've relied on a calculated value. What I mean is this number here, the 1.5, that's come from a previous bit of the question. Um, and there's always a chance I could have got the previous bit wrong. So there is an alternative method that I can use. I could use the equation uh, resistance is equal to voltage squared divided by power. Now this is an equation that you should know, but just to work out where that comes from, it comes from the fact that power is equal to current times voltage. Um, but I also know that current is equal to voltage divided by resistance. Um, so I can substitute these into each other, I can substitute 2 into 1, uh, and I get power is equal to voltage over resistance multiplied by voltage, which is V squared over R. And then if I rearrange this equation, I get R is equal to V squared over P. Um, but you should just know that equation. If I do it through that method, then I would get my voltage of 6.0 volts all squared divided by the power, which is 9.0, which also comes out as 4. Ohms. And look, naughty me, I forgot to put the uh, ohm symbol in there, so I'll just add it in now. AB is one meter long and has a resistance of five ohms. The lamp has normal brightness when the sliding contact is at X. This is the sliding contact is moved to B. Without an explanation, explain why the lamp becomes dimmer. So I've just uh, brought over a copy of the diagram to make it a little bit easier to see what we're dealing with here. Um, what we're doing is we're moving the resistance, sorry, we're moving the wire uh, from X to B. So we need to think about what that's going to have, what effect that's going to have. Um, so the first thing that's going to happen to that is the resistance of the wire will increase. Now that will happen because the electrons will now have to move through a larger amount of metal. So rather than just going uh, from the battery through A and then out, they've now got to go all the way through to B. So they've got a greater amount of metal to travel through, so the resistance is higher. Um, so we then need to think, well, what effect will that be? Well, that means that the current will become lower. Because the current's lower, and we know that power is equal to current times voltage, the current's dropping, that means the power's dropping. So now we're asked to calculate the distance AX for the lamp to have normal brightness. Um, so first of all, it's worth thinking about, in order to have normal brightness, we need the lamp to have a voltage of 6 volts. That means that we need the wire here to also have a voltage of 6 volts because this is acting like a potential divider. If you think about what you know about a potential divider, uh, the voltage is split in the same ratio as the resistance. So because I want 6 volts to go through the lamp, and I've got 12 volts here, I want 6 volts here, that means I want the same voltage in both the lamp and the wire, which means I want the same resistance of both. 
So what I can do now is I can start to use ratio. First thing I can do is say, well, if I want my voltage of 6 volts, I'll need the same resistance as my wire. Sorry, resistance um, as a resistance I calculated for the bulb. Now, in the previous bit, uh, I calculated the uh, resistance as six, sorry, I the uh, voltage as six. I calculated the resistance as four point zero ohms. So what I need to do is work out where does it have where I have to put the side in contact in order to get four ohms. Now what I can say is that the distance is five point zero. Sorry, no, it's not. The distance is one point zero meters, and at one meter, that gives me a resistance of five ohms. So in other words, I could say that the resistance, or yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to call it this, the resistance, though it's not really. Um, I'm going to say the resistance of the wire is 5 ohms per meter. Every meter gives me 5 ohms. Um, so what I can then do is say, well, let's build an equation. I can say that, in fact, I'm going to take out this previous bit because I'm a bit unhappy with it. Um, and it doesn't look great. So I'm going to say that the resistance of the wire at a known point will be 5 multiplied by the distance. Why does that work? Well, it works because when the distance is 1 meter, that will give me a resistance of 5. 5 times 1 is 5. So I've built here an equation uh, to find the resistance at any distance. So now I can rearrange this equation and say that the distance will be equal to resistance divided by 5. Now I want my resistance to be 4 ohms. So I can say that the distance will be 4 divided by 5. And that comes out as 0 0.80 meters. Now, there's no really easy way of working out how to do that. Sometimes in these questions, you've got to use your intelligence, you've got to just look at what you've got, and you've got to try and work out the logical and sensible thing to do. But something that often happens in IGCSE exams is ratio can be really useful. Um, so you can see in this question, I was using the fact that one meter gives me five ohms of resistance, and then I can just use uh, the math knowledge uh, to work out what distance would give me my 4 ohms. So do try and use as much of the stuff that you learn in maths as you can uh, when you do physics questions. Question 7. Figure 9.1 shows a horizontal wire, PQ, placed in the gap between the north pole and the south pole of a magnet. There is a current in the wire in direction P to Q. A force acts on the current carrying wire in the magnetic field. On figure 9.1, draw an arrow labelled M to show the direction of the magnetic field in the gap between the poles along the magnet. So the first one's a bit of a gift. You need to know that magnetic fields always act from north to south. So that is my magnetic field. Part 2. Draw an arrow labelled F to show the direction of force on the current carrying wire due to the magnetic field of the magnet. And they've already marked in here the direction of the current. So, what the first thing you should be thinking is, okay, this is a Fleming's left-hand rule question. So this is a little bit difficult to do uh, on, a, on a device again, but what you will need to do is put your hand in the Fleming's left-hand rule position, and then you want your first finger, the field finger, 
Uh, this is marked B here, that's an A-level definition. So this is the field. Uh, your thumb is the false. And your uh, second finger is the current. So what you should find is that you should have your first finger pointing from north to south, so to your right, your second finger pointing away from your body, um, and then that will leave your thumb pointing down. So like I've drawn here, um, the force is acting down the page. You are then asked to state the effect of reversing the direction of the current in the wire PQ. Well, if I reverse the direction, then I change the direction of the current flowing, so my finger would now, uh, my second finger would now be pointing straight towards me, which would mean my thumb would point up. So it will reverse the direction of the force. Part C. The magnet is, remo is removed and the horizontal current carrying wire is left on its own, as shown in figure 2. Sorry, 9.2. On 9.2, Sketch the pattern of magnetic field due to the current in the wire. Indicate the field direction. So to do this question, you need to use the right hand grip rule. So again, take your right hand, your thumb should point from P towards Q, and what you will find is your fingers curl around in the direction that I'm going to show you on the board. So that's what you would get. Um, now that's not enough, so you actually need to draw some more rings to show that you get concentric field patterns. Now I've drawn them very, very poorly, so again, make sure that they are circular, make sure they're centered on that wire. The current in PQ is increased. State the effect this change in the current has on the magnetic field. You should remember that there are three ways of increasing the force. Um, so if you increase the current, you will increase the magnetic field. Finally, part D. A small magnet is placed at the point the magnetic field is vertically upwards. State the direction of the force on the south pole of the magnet. Well, so that's going to be placed, a small magnet is placed on the place where the field is vertically upwards. State the direction of the force on the south pole of the magnet. Um, so, um, I'm just trying to think how I can do, okay, I'm going to draw it like this. Um, so there's my wire that I had, going from P to Q. Um, and I'm just going to put in just one of my field lines. It's going like that. Um, and they've told me that I'm putting in a magnet uh, at the point where the field is vertically upward. Where the field is vertically upward, that will be like this. Uh, so, what falls with a south pole experience? Well, I've got a north pole going up. Uh, let's just change colour. My north pole is going like that at this point. And what you can think of is you can imagine well, what would happen, what would I expect to see um, if I'd put in a compass. So if there was a compass here, I'm trying to draw a compass needle there, what will it do? Well, we know the compasses line up, so I'd expect it to line up so that the north is acting that way and the south is acting that way. That means then that the force on the magnet must be downwards because the force from the magnetic field around the wire, um, the, the, the magnet that I place there, will try to line up with the field lines. Question 8. In the space below, draw the standard symbol for an LED. Um, there are different standards uh, depending on which country you're in and where you're from, but the standard uh, accepted one um, is the one I'm going to draw here. It's always worth remembering it's a triangle, 
um, and current is allowed to flow in the direction that the triangle points. So you can imagine that this way, it's sort of an arrow saying, yes, go through that way. If you try to go that way, you're gonna meet this block here. And um, this is a light emitting diode. So for anything that involves light, we draw two arrows. This is light emitting, so the arrows come outwards. It's worth noting, if you think about a light dependent resistor, we draw it like this. And the reason that we draw the two arrows coming in is because that absorbs light. 8b. Uh, in the space below, oh, sorry, uh, table 10.1 shows the truth table for a logic gate. State the name of the logic gate, which has got logic gate, which has this truth table. Um, so this is another one of those things that really there's there's no cheat that I can tell you about this. Um, you've just got to know it. Um, you've just got to know that this is a nor gate. Uh, that means a not or gate. Um, so if you remember, an or gate will give you an output of one. Uh, if it is either, if either one of the inputs is true, well, this one's only giving you an output when they're both false, so that would make it a NOR gate. Okay, coming up to the hardest question in the test. It is possible to connect together to the two, sorry, it's possible to connect together the two inputs, the two inputs, of the gate in B. Using two or more of the logic gates in B, design a circuit which has two inputs and one output, which has the truth table shown in table 10.2. And what we want something, what we want is something that is zero when both of the inputs are zero and otherwise is always one. Now what we know is that this is just a simple OR gate. However, you're being asked to make an OR gate out of two NOR gates. And there was a clever little uh, question that they asked you earlier. They, well, a little hint. They said it's possible to connect together the two inputs of the gate. So let's start off with just one NOR gate. This is the symbol for a NOR gate. Now, I'm going to make this the intermediate point X. And I already know that from a NOR gate, at the intermediate point X, I get 1, 0, and 0. Now, if I've got a NOR gate, I'm just going to put in the truth table again um, to remind you so there's i1 there's input 2 and there's output so if it's 0 0 a nor gate gives you a 1 if it's 0 1 you get a 0 if it's 1 0 you get a 0 and if it's 1 1 you get a 0 so i've got something here where i've got a 1 now the neat little thing is what I can do now is I can take this output and I can make it a double input. What that means is that the input X here will be the same input for both. So if I have 0, 0, then I know X will be 1. But what I can do is on this second NOR gate, oh, I haven't made it a NOR gate, sorry, now it's a NOR gate. Um, on this second NOR gate, I can see that if I put into it 1, 1, it will give me an output of 0. 1, 1, I wanted an output of 0, so something's gone wrong. Let me just think about the logic that I was talking about there. Start off with 0, 0, going in. My intermediate point will be 1. That means that I'll get 1, 1 here. Oh, there we go. So I'll get a 0 coming out, which is what I want. What will happen if I put a 0, 1 in? If I put in a 0 and a 1, then I get a 0 and a 1 there. 
So I get a zero as my output. Ah, here we go, yes. I've got, that means that zero and zero are my inputs here. Zero and zero go, both go to there, which means my output is a one. If I put in a one and a zero, that means I get a one there and a zero there. I get a one there and a zero there. That gives me a zero output at x. So from x, I'm gonna put in a zero there and a zero there. That means that my input is a zero and a zero. My output's a one, which is what I want. And if I put in a one and a one, one and a one gives me a zero. So I'll get a zero there, zero and zero going in there, zero and zero will give me one. This is probably the hardest thing on the test. You were asked to label an intermediate point your circuit with X, complete the table. Well, I've already done that up here. Um, this was exceptionally hard. Part 9. A wooden block has a volume of 210 centimetres cubed and a mass of 180 grams. Calculate the density of the wooden block. Much simpler here. Um, we're going to use the equation that density, which I'm going to use the Greek letter rho for, is equal to mass divided by volume. My mass is 180 grams divided by a volume of 210 centimeters cubed. And when I do well, 180 divided by 210, I get 0 0.86. Now, I've done grams divided by centimeters cubed. That means that the unit is grams per centimeter cubed. So 0 0.86 grams per centimeter cubed. The block is held just above the surface of a liquid of density 0 0.88 grams per centimeter cubed. Predict and explain what happens when the block is released. So the key thing to know is that something will float if it's less dense than a fluid. So here it will float because it's less dense. Than the liquid. Again, just something you need to know and learn. If something will float if it's more, so if it's less dense than the liquid, it will sink if it's more dense. Question 10. A loudspeaker is built into the side of a swimming pool. The loudspeaker produces sound waves in the water of wavelength 0 0.25 meters. The frequency of the sound waves is 6 kilohertz. Now, there's a bit of a trick here. So the first thing you need to probably do is make a little note to yourself that 6.0 kilohertz is equal to 6 times 10 to the 3 hertz, or 6,000 hertz. Calculate the speed of the sound waves in water. So again, we're going to use the same equation that we used earlier on in the test. We're going to use the fact that the speed of a wave, or the velocity of the wave, is equal to its frequency times its wavelength. So, um, this time I don't need to do any rearranging. I can just say that is equal to the frequency of 6,000 hertz, multiplied by the wavelength, of 0 0.25, which comes out as 1,500 meters. Then ask to state the typical value of the speed of sound in air. The speed of sound in air is anything between 300 uh, to about 360 meters per second. Uh, the speed of sound does vary depending on temperature and humidity, so you could have any value in that range. For safety, I would tend to say around about 320 will usually be correct. 
State and explain for the sound produced by the loudspeaker how the wavelength of sound in air compares to the wavelength of sound in water. Now, this is exactly the same thing that you were asked earlier. Um, so what we can see is that the speed of sound in water is much higher than the speed of sound in air. So if you go back and look at the earlier question, um, then you'll see I kind of talked through this again, so I'm not going to really go th through it in that much detail a second time round, except to say that the answer will be that the wavelength in water Wavelength in water is greater than air, and for the same reason, it's because it travels further in the same time. Now, this was another tricky question. Because like previously, this was only worth one mark, so you had to have both points. Part B. Sound is a longitudinal wave. Explain what is meant by a longitudinal wave. This is something that you must go and learn. So you need to know that the oscillation, or you can say vibration if you want to, of the particles... is parallel to the direction of travel. Or if you want to be super posh, you could say propagation. Lots of people messed up on this question um, by saying it vibrates left to right or up or down. Well, left to right and up and down doesn't mean anything unless you know which way the, the waves are travelling. So, what we want is if these are the waves, if the wave itself, if the direction of energy transfer is going that way, then the individual particles will vibrate backwards and forwards that way. But you need to put it in these terms, you need to learn this. Part C. The sound emerges from a loudspeaker through a gap. The sound diffracts as it passes through the gap. State how the width of the gap uh, affects the diffraction. So you just, again, need to go away and learn this. You need to know that the smaller the gap, the greater the deflection. The, the, sorry, the greater the refraction. You also need to know that the greater the wavelength, the greater the diffraction too. Now, a lot of people said something like, diffraction is greatest when the wavelength is approximately equal to the gap size. Now, that is true but it's not what they expect at IGCSE. So you probably go away with saying it, but it's probably even better just to learn that for IGCSE, generally they're happy with smaller gaps, give you more refraction. Sorry, did I say refraction? <laughs> Shame. Smaller gaps give you more diffraction. Um, and greater wavelengths give you more diffraction. Okay, we're back to another refraction question. Red light travelling in air strikes a curved surface at a semicircular glass block at P. Figure 8.1 shows the ray of light. Now, um, it's probably worth just pointing out here. Lots of people got a little bit confused by the fact that um, they said red light. And some people started writing about red light in their answers. So, um, why do we have a single colour? Um, why do we care about that? Um, that's because a single colour, that will have a single refractive index. Um, if you think about dispersion, and you think about prisms, you have learned that uh, different wavelengths can have slightly different refractive index. 
Um, so by having just red light, we get away with that problem. So that's why they say red light. There's no other reason for it. So light travels in a straight line from O to Q. Explain why the light does not change direction as it enters a glass at P. Well, to do that, you need to think about the normal. There it is. I'll try to draw it in there and make it a bit thick so you can see it. Um, it enters at 90 degrees. Sorry, no, it doesn't. It enters at zero degrees to the normal. And because it's entering at zero degrees to the normal, um, it has no refraction. Light travels in the glass cube where it strikes the edge of the block at 30 degrees to the normal. The light then emerges into the air. The refractive index of the glass is 1.5. Calculate the angle between the normal and the ray. So I'm not going to go and talk about little cars again. You can do it yourself. Run your fingers down along uh, this ray here, along the, ins the, not the, the ray, along the ray inside the glass block, and you'll see as it emerges, the finger on this side of it will travel faster, while this finger is still inside the block and traveling more slowly. Um, so it's going to bend away from the normal like that. I've really exaggerated it there. Um, it's going to bend away like that. So this is where it gets a little bit tricky. What are these two rays? Well, this is actually the instant, the instant angle. This is actually the angle of refraction. And the reason for that is that the refracted ray is always inside the block. If you got that, you got the rest of the question right. If you got it wrong, um, then you got the rest of it wrong. So it then was quite simple. We're just going to say that refractive index is sine i over sine r. Well, I know that the refractive index is 1.5. So 1.5 will be equal to sine of the angle of instance, whatever it is, divided by sine of 30. So i will be inverse sine of 1.5 multiplied by sine of 30 degrees. Um, plug all of that into your calculator and you get 49 degrees. And it says uh, on figure 8.1, sketch the path of light as it emerges into the air. Um, you would probably want to measure that with a protractor if you have one, just to make sure that you definitely get all the marks. Um, but in this case, the line that I've drawn would have been fine. The direction of light striking the, surf, striking the curved surface of the glass block has changed. The angle between the ray and the normal at Q gradually increases from 30 degrees to 90 degrees. Describe what happens to the light that strikes the block Q as this angle increases. So I think it's quite helpful here to think about uh, drawing a diagram first, just to show what will happen. Um, we're going to start off with it the way that's been shown in the diagram. So we'll start off doing that. And what will happen is eventually we will reach a point where if I increase the angle of refraction, sorry, the angle of, yeah, we'll sort of the angle of refraction, it will go along the boundary. And if I try and increase it any more than that, then I'm going to start getting total internal reflection. Um, so the three things they wanted was, the first thing that happens is the angle of refraction increases, then we reach the point at which the refracted ray travels along the boundary, So this was point one, that's just by that diagram. This is point two, demonstrated by that diagram. And then point three, which is this diagram, um, is when the light is reflected. And we can say it's reflected back into the glass. Part 12, a 12 volt battery is connected in series to a 24 watt lamp and in parallel to a pair of interval resistors X and Y. Figure 9.1 is the circuit diagram. The 24 watt lamp lights at normal brightness when a potential difference across it is 6.0 volts. The lamp is at normal brightness, calculate its resistance. 
So we get another nice simple one. I'm going to use the equation power is current times voltage. I know that my power is 24 watts and I know that my voltage is 6 volts. So I'm going to say my I times, I can say, sorry, it's I times 6 and I can say that my current is 24 divided by 6 which is 4 amps then I can say uh, V is IR R is V over I so that would be uh, 6 divided by 4 which is 1.5 ohms. Again, the alternative method is to say that power is V squared divided by R, so that would be uh, 6 squared uh, is, sorry, 6 squared over R is equal to 24 so r is equal to 6636 divided by 24. Let's just check that math still works. Excellent, I haven't gone crazy. That's also another way of doing it. You can get there in two different methods. Determine the potential difference between a and b. Well, um, at this point, I've got a circuit that looks something like this. I've got a 12 volt battery, I've got a lamp, and I've got two resistors, and I've already worked out that the voltage there is 6 volts, um, so uh, this is now a potential divider problem. So the voltage across A and B must be 6 volts too. Calculate the combined resistance of the power of identical resistors. Well, again, um, same as the exact same as in the last question, I can say that the ratio of voltages is equal to the ratio of the resistors. I know that this one has a resistance of 1.5 ohms. Therefore, if they've got the same voltage across them in a potential divider, then they must have the same resistance. So the resistance here must be 1.5 ohms too. And finally, I'm asked for the resistance of resistor X. Well, I know that they're both identical resistors. So that means that they both have the same resistance. I'm going to call it R. Now I'm going to use the equation 1 over the total resistance is equal to 1 over resistor 1 plus 1 over resistor 2. That's for resistors in parallel. So 1 over the total resistance of 1.5 must be equal to 1 over R plus 1 over R. Those R's are the same. So I get 1 over 1.5 is equal to 2 over R. Rearrange it. That would give me R is equal to 2 times 1.5 divided by 1, so I get a resistance of 3 ohms. Finally, resistance X is removed from the circuit in figure 9.1. Explain why the lamp becomes dimmer. Okay, so removing X will increase the total resistance. And sometimes people have a problem remembering that. Um, they think, well, a resistor resists current, so getting rid of one should, uh, sorry, should reduce the total resistance, right? They mean the clues in a name. But don't forget, as current comes out the battery and goes through here, it has a choice of either going through resistor X or through resistor Y. So two resistors in parallel have a lower resistance than just one of them. So, removing X has increased the resistance. Because we've increased the resistance, we've decreased the current. And because power 
is current times voltage, we decrease the power. Uh, that's available. The other way of thinking about it is uh, we increase the voltage across resistors uh, going back to this potential divider problem um, we've changed the ratio now the resistor here has got bigger which means it's going to get a bigger share of the voltage um, so if we've increased the voltage across the resistors that will decrease the voltage across the bulb and if you drop the voltage on the bulb you drop its power. You have done incredibly well to sit through all this. Sorry if I've droned on at you or if I've made some mistakes. I'm sure you'll point it out to me in the comments. Um, but well done for sitting this exam. Um, it was a tough one, so you've all done really well to get through it. Um, if you're one of my students, then please do come and chat to me about any problems you're having. Um, if you're another member of staff, stu uh, student, then speak to your teacher. And if you just found this video on YouTube, um, then you can leave a question in the comments and I'll do my best to clear up anything you may have. Um, happy revising and good luck with your final IGCSEs.